good afternoon to one and all all the dignitaries uh, my dear colleagues hods and the students uh, welcome you all to the uh, today's webinar in quantum computing uh, a beginner's perspective at the outset i would like to welcome our chairperson uh, madam rama devi venkatpati in her absence here i also welcome our ceos uh, mr pramod gowda as well as mr rajiv gowda in their absence here i also welcome our executive director dr shankpal sir in his absence here i welcome our beloved principal dr tk satish sir who is in the studio welcome you sir thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir. for your time sir i also welcome uh, vice principal dr yogesh in his absence here i welcome all the hods my esteemed colleagues importantly the students uh very very importantly today is uh, the resource person dr bal krishnan sir uh, who is working as a professor at uh, the most reputed organization in our country vellore institute of technology which is located in vellore i uh, welcome you sir on behalf of our uh, college my department on behalf of our students and i on my personal behalf i welcome you sir i welcome to thank the you. show thank you uh to give a brief introduction about our uh, today's resource person dr balakrishnan sir he is working as a professor uh, at vellore institute of technology uh, vellore who is working in the department of physics as a professor he did his bsc and msc from madras university and he obtained his phd degree from nit tirchi his area of uh, research is quantum computation and information he has published more than 30 papers in the national and international journals and today he is with us okay to give a, a very brief introduction about the quantum computation once again i welcome balakrishnan sir on my personal behalf uh, now i would like to invite our uh, principal sir to give to address our students over to you sir satish sir Uh, I think there is some technical glitches. Uh, I think Sir will come back. Yes, Sir. Satish Sir, may I request you to address our students? I think you are on mute. Rajendra uh, Sir, yes, Sir. Thank you very much, and a warm welcome to Krishna Sir and. Uh, very good afternoon to all uh, the respected colleagues of epcet and other people and also my budding engineers so i think you know you need to understand that you know quantum computing the work started somewhere in the 1980s as such okay from paul benif and various other particular people from their particular this people have been trained to see that how essentially they can increase the computational speed as such and the various other particular problems that were essentially you know becomes very difficult for us to solve it in, solve it in a classical way as such so if you look from that particular point most of the classical problems whatever that we have got it can also be solved by com the com the quantum computing particular point so but at the same time you know it essentially poses a lot of challenge as such in terms of the turing machine particular itself the concept of the particular point which essentially has been you know i mean uh, elongated by various other particular people as such so looking into that particular point today i am very grateful to balakrishna sir for the time that he is spending with us to essentially give us a salient features of quantum computing what it is about why it is about and why do we need to study this particular point this is a very very important particular point because as next few years this is going to be the thing as such so i think you know nasa is already probably is in the forefront of this particular front there is all, all other people are essentially working it out so i think you know lot of good work is happening it out and this is going to be a main stay in the in the computing particular era. so in that particular sense uh, my respectful thanks to balakrishna sir and also to the faculty of uh, the basic sciences led by shri maruti sir for taking Thank this you. particular opportunity and inviting balakrishna sir and you know essentially making our students aware of this particular topic so once again 
my sincere thanks to all of you sir once again balakrishna sir thank you very much for your time mark thank you sir, sir. Thank wonderful you. job thank, thank you, you very much then keep the work well done sir thank you thank you very much satish sir uh, i know that sir was in a meeting with the hods uh, but you took a break for few minutes for the sake of our first year students and he attended this uh, thank you very much sir uh, now may i request balakrishnan sir uh, to take over the uh, session balakrishnan sir over to you yeah thank you sir shall i share the screen yes sir please go ahead sir yeah. No, no problem, sir. This is this is a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, Balakrishna, sir, please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Right. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Just once again, can you confirm, please? Can you see the screen? Full screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very much. Okay, uh, so at the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, the organizers of uh, East Point College of Engineering and Technology, Bangalore, uh, for giving me this opportunity to interact with uh, young minds. And my special thanks goes to uh, Beloved Principal, sir, and uh, Dr. Marudhi ji for uh, uh, talking to me and uh, related to this talk. And I also thank all these students who are... Uh, uh viewing this live uh, session and i just want to make it one point clear as uh, sir pointed out i just want to give you the flavor of the subject uh quantum computation it is at the very infant stage uh, we require a lot of young minds to involve to do a lot of wonders so the aim of this particular session is to introduce the quantum computation from a beginner's point of view and as a researcher working in this area i wish to call you people to work in this area of research it is fascinating not just because i am working in this field but the field itself is very interesting so i want to construct my presentation as a basically a two step uh, the first one will cover the historical point of view it is a very lightweight and uh, basically i want to give you the the chronological way of introducing the subject nothing more nothing less then i will take you to some of the basics of quantum computation in terms of uh, terminology technical terminology but uh, i will not give you more details because it requires a lot of uh, technical details and uh, i will give you suitable references wherein you can see the uh, details so this is the plan of uh, today's uh, session let me take you to the first part and uh, the first part of the story we will start with quantum mechanics then we will get into classical computers then i will tell you something about quantum computation and information right so we are all know very well about this gentleman galileo galilei perhaps uh, we were inspired by this gentleman in starting from our childhood and here you can see the interesting aspect you know the history really consider galileo has a philosopher but he is supposed to be a scientist he is supposed to treat him as a scientist and uh, interesting to note that he uh, passed away in the year 1642 i just want to mention this here because there is an interesting correlation in the history of mankind just a piece of message just remember this year year in which uh, galileo passed away 1642 right so moment we say galileo we always think of a telescope who uh, galileo devised a telescope to look at the celestial objects and uh, uh, he contributed a lot in terms of uh, the good olden days astronomy right interesting once again i let me tell you this fact 1642 note that in the year 1642 on the christmas day sir isaac newton was born 
very interesting coincidence right galileo galilei passed away in the year 1642 in the same year sir isaac newton was born and you know pretty well i newton contributed a lot right starting for our, our schooling we always learn about newton and its outstanding contribution to say few contributions moment we say newton we always think of an apple sitting under the tree and uh, talking about gravitation and so on and so forth we also very well that single handedly he constructed the concept known as mechanics which we call it as classical mechanics or newtonian mechanics it was a very well developed subject which talks about the macroscopic objects so from our uh, school days we are very familiar with the first law of uh, newton second law of newton and everyone knows the third law right to every action that is equal and opposite reaction so we are very much familiar and you also know that newton contributed in terms of mathematics right uh, the differential equation was introduced by newton uh, though it was developed by leibniz mathematician independently and uh, newton contributed in fact a lot not only in uh, mechanics not only in gravity not only in thermodynamics newton's law of cooling and optics also he contributed right so there are so many things and you might ask the question uh, why one single person or how one single person can contribute this much right sir isaac newton and i always say jovially in the classroom that newton was able to contribute much because newton was not married okay on a very lighter side i'm making this statement so newton was not married and uh, he contributed a lot okay and you know this gentleman the other side left hand side you know sir isaac newton on the right hand side there was a han sung hero who was none other than christian huygens why there was a battle in the classical world because newton uh, who was lime light at that time proposed the corpuscular theory particle nature of light and uh, Uh, his contemporary christian huygen proposed wave theory but uh, no one looked into wave aspect proposed by huygen and it was in the darkness for nearly 200 years then you know pretty well hendrich hertz came into picture who proved the wave nature of light right so this was an interesting battle uh, in 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 terms of particle nature and wave nature so now we have a well developed uh, a concept known as dual nature of light and uh, we study in our schooling as well as in college right i just want to remember this slide because the battle not only exists in the classical world but also in the quantum world right i just want to take you to the transition period from classical to quantum through this uh, gentleman namely james clerk maxwell Maxwell was considered as a well-known theoretician. So you know very well why we appreciate Maxwell, right? Because scientists thought that electricity and magnetism are two different aspects of matter or science. And James Clerk Maxwell very interestingly combined all the basic uh, laws associated with electricity and magnetism. not only that uh, he combined the basic fundamental concepts like permeability of free space permittivity of free space to that of speed of light so james clerk maxwell was an excellent theoretician who combined electricity and magnetism now we have electromagnetic theory so we enjoy this session only because of this gentleman maxwell all the satellite telecommunication become possible because of this gentleman right i put this uh, in a very specific reason you can see uh, here james clerk maxwell passed away in the year 1879 right you know albert einstein born in the same year 1879 look at the interesting coincidence in the history of mankind so galileo galilei who passed away in the year 1642 was replaced by another giant in physics namely sir isaac newton similarly uh, maxwell who passed away in the year 1879 was replaced by another giant in physics namely albert einstein 
Right. So that is an interesting fact about the name itself. Look at this name, Einstein. Look at it in the form of a spelling. E-I-N. Yes, T-E-I-N. So E-I-N is present on either side of the letter S and T. So if you know the language German, you can appreciate what is the meaning of the word E-I-N. E-I-N means unique or one. If you know German, you can always cross check. E-I-N means it's unique or one. So let us try to interpret it, the name Einstein itself. So we can say yes refers to space, T refers to time. So now read the word Einstein. So space is one, time is one. It's an interesting name, right? Space is one and time is one. On ironically, Einstein mentioned that it's there is a space-time curvature, space-time ramping. His name says space is one and time is one. But as per Einstein's relativity concept, space-time wrapping, we have a space-time curvature. And you know pretty well Einstein did a lot. He, he was considered as a born genius. And most of the modern day scientists were inspired by uh, the work of Einstein. And you know very well, Einstein was uh, awarded Nobel Prize in the year 1921. We are exactly celebrating the centenary year of Nobel Prize winning uh, in photoelectric effect by celebrated Albert Einstein. So uh, Einstein did a lot as like Newton. Once again, I pose the same question. Right? Why uh, Einstein was able to contribute this much? We had an answer from uh, Newton's life that Newton was not married and he contributed. And uh, here, what is the story? Why Einstein was able to contribute? Very funny answer is that Einstein got married twice officially. So moral of the story is that don't get married once, get married twice so that you can contribute. It's just on a lighter vein I'm saying. Right. So look at that interesting coincidence in the history of uh, science. Fine. So question is, why we require quantum mechanics? You know pretty well, uh, Newton developed the concept of uh, our laws of mechanics nearly 200 years back. And uh, everything is fine. Whatever uh, happening, which can be seen through our naked eye, can be explained by classical mechanics. The three laws are sufficient to explain anything. Basically, it's a second Newton's equation, so second order differential equation, and you require two initial conditions. Once you know the initial condition, you can very precisely solve it. Then what is the problem? Right. But the modern day scientists face some problems, which I'm going to list out now, which force the scientists to introduce or devise a new treatment known as quantum mechanics. The first and foremost trouble for the scientist of olden days was structure of an atom. So we don't know what is the fundamental element. And after realizing that atom is a fundamental element, building block of all the elements, what are the constituents of it? That was a million dollar question at that point of time. I'm talking about 1890, 1895, those period. And then slowly people get into the concept of particles, electron, proton, and their existence and all. And a lot of proposal, you know pretty well, J.J. Thompson, a putting model, and uh, there are very interesting uh, proposals were at that time. But uh, none of the classical concepts were fit into uh, the explanation of structure of an atom. So the point is, uh, the nucleus, which contains the proton, which are positively charged, and neutrons are neutral charges. If you assume electrons to be stationary outside the nucleus, what will happen? the positively charged new proton will attract the electron. So after some time, electrons supposed to exit, exist inside the nucleus. But that was not the case. Electrons always found outside the nucleus. So if that is the case, electrons supposed to revolve. So if the electron starts to revolve, then what will happen? Electrons supposed to release all its energy and finally spiral down to the nucleus. That is also not happening. So classical concept could not explain the atomic structure. And another well-known uh, failure of classical uh, concept is hydrogen spectrum. People know the continuous spectrum, but uh, the line spectrum of hydrogen was really puzzling at that time. 
the third instant was specific heat capacity of solids and uh, you can see the two graphs two graphs are plotted using the uh, well known contribution of einstein and uh, d by but classical concept could not explain it and the fourth most important striking failure of classical mechanics is black body spectrum perhaps this would be the starting point for modern day science in general uh, we can say and in particular i would say quantum mechanics so this is the starting point and uh, black body spectrum was very well explained by the proposal of max planck max planck equation e equal to h nu was revolutionized and that really clearly explained black body spectrum so these are the four major instants uh, which clearly indicate the failure of classical mechanics in other words the need of new concept the new concept is nothing but quantum mechanics right quantum mechanics uh, was not developed single handedly there are a lot of scientists involved and put their best effort to develop a well known theory known as quantum mechanics so most of the names are known to you albert einstein niels bohr erwin schrodinger and max planck pauli dirac fermi and there are so many people the list is very exhaustive list who contributed uh, in the development of quantum mechanics right so here also you can see a battle in the quantum world in this time uh, the battle exists between albert einstein and niels bohr so what was the battle einstein uh, he accepted the concept of uh, quantization planck's quantization principle but uh, as such he did not accept uh, quantum mechanics because essentially quantum mechanics is based on probabilistic theory so einstein did not accept uh, that concept on the other hand niels bohr was an excellent theoretical physicist on par with einstein and uh, he uh, counter attacked einstein's idea and uh, he started arguing that quantum mechanics indeed it's a relevant theory to explain the microscopic world and there are some interesting statement which you always come across uh, to understand einstein's standpoint so some of them are shown here you can see uh, einstein uh, made a statement that god never play dice god does not throw dice right it's a very celebrated statement uttered by albert einstein just to indicate that god never does anything on a probabilistic theory only a deterministic one as like classical mechanics but on contrary quantum mechanics is built upon probabilistic nature nature right these are also well known uh, statement which always you have come across when einstein talk about quantum mechanics right and to substantiate the argument einstein proposed a concept which is known as einstein podolsky rosen paradox shortly known as epr paradox it was initiated by einstein to counter attack niels bohr what is the argument the argument is that quantum mechanics is an incomplete theory quantum Me this is the paper quantum mechanics is an incomplete theory which talks about the spooky action at a distance so this is a word which was used by einstein podolsky and rosen in that paper to show that something wrong in quantum mechanics to describe the microscopic world so there was a fundamental problem in the description of quantum mechanics this was the argument of uh, our beloved friends einstein podolsky and rosen they suggested to go for a new theory don't stick on with quantum mechanics so try to find out a new theory and that was the argument and a note that uh, epr paper this paper was published in the year 1935 nearly for 20 years 20 to 30 years the concept of epr paradox exist then there was a gentleman in the name john bell who worked on the concept of epr and proved that einstein was wrong einstein was wrong so he devised bell devised a certain set of equation which is known as bell's inequality and bell's inequality helps to understand the existence of variables known as hidden variables and note that quantum mechanics does not obey bell's inequality which strongly suggests that quantum mechanics is a complete theory 
so john bell proved the incorrect observation of einstein podolsky and rosen and quantum mechanics is treated as the fundamental to understand the nature so this was the one side of the story the another side is classical computation okay parallelly we developed into other side uh, in terms of physics you know we developed into the semiconductor technology transistors and so on and so forth so once we have the transistors then we have integrated circuits and so on and so forth right the another parallel paramount uh, importance was on classical computation basically what is a computation so you know pretty well addition is one of the simplest basic uh, computation we do right whatever we do a machine can also do it is uh, said by the two gentlemen known as uh, turing and church and they come up with the concept known as universal programming language it is basically known as church turing thesis church turing thesis helps you to understand the more basic concept of quantum computing classical computation sorry classical computation in general classical computers you know alan turing is regarded as a father of a classical computation right and you know pretty well when the size of a first classical computer device was this much and now we have a palm top and the functionality of these two uh, computers are the same so we have reduced the size of the computer to a smaller one at the same time we increase the speed of the computer to a greater extent so as the year goes on you know what happened the size of the computer getting decreased and speed of the computer getting increased and the question was can we achieve this infinitesimal level and garden moore who computed the, this particular graph it is known as moore's law so moore's law predicts that we will exhaust all the space in an integrated chip and we can't minimize the classical computer no more so that was the prediction and the entire classical computation was get into the other side of the story namely quantum computation this was introduced by this gentleman uh, none other than richard feynman and note that next to einstein albert einstein richard feynman was the celebrated particle physicist who won nobel prize for his outstanding contribution in particle physics and richard feynman delivered a very celebrated talk in caltech university at the time he uttered this word plenty of rooms at the bottom so richard feynman motivated the scientists to work on two interesting fields one is nano science and technology the other one is quantum computation and i would say a formal birth of quantum computation would happen only through his speech richard feynman and scientists started working on quantum computation but not in a very formal way that's that is the main point okay it is not a very formal structure of uh, analyzing things they started working on this aspect and two breakthrough happened through grover's algorithm the other one is shor's prime factorization you know we always understand the consequence once we understand the consequence then we go back to our basics right grover's algorithm it's a very important one which helps to understand the unsorted database for example you have a telephone directory you want to find out my phone number so you know my name my name is balakrishnan so you know how to find out my name and and you also find out my telephone number it is a sorted database on the other hand if i give my phone number can you find out my name right that is known as unsorted database if you have a classical computer this will take n by 2 queries for example if there are 100 entries and the classical computer will take 50 queries 50 times it will make an attempt to give you the correct answer but grover's quantum church algorithm can find out in a square root of 100 times what is square root of 100 just 10 attempt think of the difference classical computer takes 50 attempt in a database of 100 entry whereas quantum computer will take only 10 attempts out of 100 entries note that if you have so many data which is more powerful grover's search algorithm 
Right. So this is the most important uh, concept Grover come up in terms of uh, quantum algorithm. And the next aspect was uh, Shor's prime factorization. This was very striking because uh, the RSA crypto system is what we follow, which is assumed to be the most safest and secured uh, algorithm. You can't break RSA crypto system. On the other hand, sure, come up with a concept known as prime factorization algorithm. Using quantum computer, you can uh, achieve uh, sure's prime factorization algorithm and you can crack RSA crypto system. That has become a real threat for the world most secured crypto system, namely RSA. After hearing this, a lot of countries started involving in the research. They dumped a lot of countries, started pumping their money in their budget to work on quantum computer, especially from quantum cryptography point of view. So you always want to have a very safe and secure communication, right? You never want your Gmail password to be looted. You never want your account to be um, hacked by anyone. So these are all quite common things. So we want to have a very safe and secure thing that is possible if you have a quantum computer. Right. So these two path breaking works really got the attention of many scientists, not only from computer science point of view, but also physics point of view. Right. You will understand why physicists come into picture. Understand the role, quantum mechanics one side, classical computation another side. The need of quantum computation is through minimizing the existing computer. So we want to minimize the existing classical computer and we want to increase the speed of the computer. This, these are the two demands of a classical computer scientist side. On the other hand, cryptography point of view, if you have a quantum computer, you would break the most secured cryptography system known as RSC crypto system. So all these things really force us to come up with a new concept known as quantum computation. Essentially, quantum computation is nothing but the application of quantum mechanics uh, in the computation process so as to minimize the computer, so as to increase the speed of the computer, so as to have a secure communication, secure quantum communication. So uh, the buzzing word is secure quantum crypto system from the application point of view. Right. The second part of the story, uh, I will take you to some of the basic terminology which you're supposed to know. Some of them are quantum states, quantum gates, and the physical realization of quantum computer, and a few concluding remarks. This is slightly involved. Let me try to make it as simple as possible. Right. In the case of a classical computer, the basic uh, entities are bits, binaries, right? Zeros and ones are binaries. So if you enter your data in the computer, it always translated in the strings of zeros and ones. So you always find 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, right? So that is nothing but the bits. So the analog of bits is nothing but quantum bits, shortly known as qubits. The first and foremost terminology you're supposed to learn is a qubit. So note that what is a qubit? What is a qubit? How can I realize it? Understand how do we realize a bit? Bit is nothing but 0 or 1, on or off state, high voltage or low voltage. Right? Anything closer to zero, you say it is a low voltage, which you designate it as zero. And anything closer to five volt, then you say it is a high, then it, you call it as on. So it one state, right? Zero state and one state. But what? how can you physically realize quantum bits, otherwise qubits? There are a lot of uh, proposals. Here, there are simple one. So you can consider the two-level system. Two-level system, you can have something like a ground state and something like an excited state. So the ground state is something like your uh, zero and excited state is one. So get zero and get one. So this is what we have. So this is the Dirac notation, get zero. That's a get is a Dirac notation, uh, which deals with an abstract way. You may not specify what physical system you are working on, but still you can describe your theory. So that's what the abstractness involved in the description. This concept was introduced by Dirac and hence it is known as Dirac notation, get zero, get one. 
little bit of technical details, but uh, we have no other option with, without which it is difficult to proceed. So KET0 and KET1. So these are the uh, two qubits. In fact, it's not two qubits. It's one single qubit, which has two different states. KET0, it's something like your uh, off state. KET1 is something like your on state. And now the basic difference is something like the superposition. Understand, assume that you have a switch, right? We always look at, you can, in your room, you can see a switch, classical switch. The switch can store only two information. What are the two information? Either on state or off state. Either the so switch can be on or off. This is a scenario in the macroscopic world. But in the microscopic world, scenario is entirely different because superposition is also allowed. What is the superposition? The linear combination of on state and off state is also a legitimate state. Here you can see ket psi. Psi is known as uh, the B function and uh, A and B are complex numbers which satisfy this particular condition mod A square plus mod B square equal to 1. Note that it is not one single combination of A and B which satisfy this condition. There are very many complex numbers which satisfy this particular condition. So you may ask the question, uh, why we need to impose this condition? This condition comes from the probability of uh, consideration of probability uh, of normalization. So this is the fundamental one, fundamental restriction, but the superposition do exist. So in the case of classical world, you have either on state or off state. But in the case of microscopic world, we have one, we have the superposition of on state and off state. Meaning to say, in the classical switch, you can store only two information. If at all you have a quantum switch, you can store infinite combination, infinite amount of information between zero and one. So note the point can store a lot of information in one single quantum bit. So this was a really striking one. And this is explained here. So spin half particle is considered as a qubit photon polarization. You can think of a photon which has a right circular polarization, left polarization. Those are all designated at zero and one state and they can call it as qubit so there are many proposals for the uh, realization of a qubit and this picture is uh, technically known as block sphere which indicates gives you the understanding that you have so many states are possible between zero and one you can see on the upper arrow get zero and the down one is get one between that it's uh you have a lot of points it is a kind of a uh, a ball that's why we say it's a sphere one single qubit you can store a lot of information this is a very very important message so classical uh, bit which can store only two information in the quantum bit we can store infinite amount of information but the question is how to harness it how to store the information how to retrieve the information that is the challenge that is the challenge right most important buzzing word is entanglement. So if you say you are uh, learning about quantum computer, you're getting involved in quantum computation, you can't really escape from this word known as entanglement. Okay, what is meant by entanglement? Uh, entanglement means it's a, it's a folded finger. Uh, in German, it's known as folded finger. So what is the point? The point is that you have two electrons. Let us assume that we have two electrons, the two electrons interacting each other. You know pretty well electrons are negatively charged particles and uh, you are allowing the two particles to interact with each other. After some time, they get into the quantum state which cannot be separated, which cannot be separated. Technically, which cannot be written down as a tensor product. There is a symbol here, right? So cross, so this cannot be done if the state is entangled the state you cannot really write down the state as a tensor product once again tensor product is a technical term so what is meant by tensor product tensor product is nothing but when you have a two subsystem how it is interacting physically that can be translated uh, mathematically in terms of a tensor product 
So if you write down the state of two particle system, two electron system as a tensor product, then you call such a state as a product state. Let me repeat. If you write down two particle state of the system as a tensor product of single qubit system, then it is a product state. And what is the meaning? Meaning physically what I can say, you can disturb one electron, nothing will happen to the another electron. So there is no interaction, no influence on each other. That's why this is the case. So the product states are of uh, not much significant one. On the other hand, when you write down the state of the quantum system, which uh, in the form of entangled state, how do you define entangled state? Very simple. If you are not able to express the state of the system, if you are not able to write down the state of the system as a tensor product, then you call it as entangled state. Understand entangled state is the most important one. All the significance of quantum computation emerges through this particular aspect known as entanglement. Note that entanglement is a special case of quantum superposition. So if someone asks you to tell the difference between the classical world and the mac mac um, macroscopic world and microscopic world. Macroscopic world is described by classical mechanics and microscopic world is described by quantum mechanics. The ma major difference, I would say, is the superposition. Superposition is a characteristic features of microscopic particle and entanglement is a special case of superposition state. And we do wonders in quantum computation all because of uh, this particular concept known as entanglement. And realization of entanglement is always an interesting one. And note that the celebrated Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paper uh, published in the year 1935 exploited entangled state. Understand? Exploited entangled state to substantiate that quantum mechanics was incorrect, was incomplete. But the same entangled state war was now considered as a resource. What is meant by resource? You know pretty well energy is a resource, right? Consideration of energy, you know pretty well. Energy is neither, uh, uh, energy cannot be created nor destroyed, right? So that's why we call it as a resource. And similarly, entanglement is considered to be a resource. Resource for what? Resource for secure communication. It's a basic entity for uh, the cryptographic system. So now the perspective of entanglement was changed over the time period. You can see here, starting from 1935, I listed down 1996, and now we come up a long way to say that entanglement is the most important resource in the future technology, what we are going to realize. Right. And one side, we have quantum states. Another side, we have quantum gates. Right. I compared classical bits, zeros and ones with the qubits namely ket0 and ket1. Similarly, classical computation, we have some of the well-known gates. What are the gates? We have AND gate, R gate, NAND gate, NOR gate, right? So only few, bunch of uh, gates only. But in the quantum world, the scenario is entirely different. Uh, any, technically speaking, any special unitary operator can be thought of a quantum gate are known as quantum operators. These two words are synonyms, quantum gates and quantum operators. And I will invariably interchange these two words while I talk. So some of the well-known quantum gates are Pauli matrices. Pauli matrices are well-known to the quantum mechanics people. And uh, without knowing that it's a quantum gate, they consider it as an operators. They used it. And in the quantum computation point of view, we call it as a quantum gates, right? And uh, once again, we have two types of gates, local gates and non-local gates. As we know very well, entanglement is the resource. How can we generate? You have to apply appropriate operation, namely gates. Certain gates can help us to generate entanglement. Such gates are known as non-local gates. So technically speaking, if you're not able to split the two qubit gates, as a tensor product, then you say it's a local, non-local gates. So non-local gates are the resource for generating entanglement, which can be used for secure communication and cryptography process and quantum communication. 
So non-local gates are the one which generate entanglement. These two gates you're supposed to uh, understand and appreciate. So you call NAND or NOR in the classical computation as universal gate. Why you call NAND as a universal gate? Because given a NAND gates, you can construct all other gates. So similarly, given a C naught, it is known as C naught. C naught is nothing but controlled knot operation. So using controlled knot operation, you can construct all other qubits in, in, in a combination, not as one single gate, as a combination. You can see the structures. And there are some interesting consequences of a computer, quantum computer, right? What is the essential difference between a classical computer and quantum computer? The three main points I would like to highlight here. So the first and foremost is the reversibility. Note that classical computation, you can't reverse it. Why it is so? Uh, for example, you can, let us assume you have the truth table of an R gate. What is an R gate? If two inputs are 0, 0, output is 0. If uh, any one of the inputs is 1, output is 1. Right? This is a, a truth table of R gate. What is a truth table of R gate? 0, 0 gives you 0. 0, 1 gives you 1. 1, 0 gives you 1. 1, 1 gives you 1. Right? So what is the meaning of reversibility? So if I give you what is the output, can you find out the input? For example, the output is 1. How do you generate the output 1? It can be any combination. It can be from 0, 1 or 1, 0 or 1, 1. So you can't really go back from the output. You can't really trace back the input. So classical computers are irreversible in nature, but quantum computers are reversible in nature why it is so unitary operations so from the output you can always find out what are the inputs the reversibility play a very fundamental role even from the thermodynamics point of view okay i give you an example so assume that you have a classical a desktop you have a desktop right and uh, you switched on uh, switched on the computer you work on the computer for some time and after some time if you touch the cpu you can see, you can feel the heat. Why heat is generated? Why heat is generated? Because the functioning of ICs, right? Heat generation. But if you have a quantum computer, heat generation will be less. Thermodynamics will come into picture because it is reversible in nature. So the quantum computers are reversible. So you can always find out the input out of your output. This is a uh, very, uh, clear cut difference between classical and quantum computer right another aspect is known as quantum superordinancy whatever you do on a classical computer that can be performed in a quantum computer also okay but uh, there are some interesting aspects also uh, which people try to show it is not the case but as far as uh, present day scenario we don't find any exemption that whatever classical uh, computer do we can also perform in quantum computer Right. The third most important aspect is no cloning theorem. You cannot copy any state. You cannot copy any unknown state precisely. Right. For example, in the case of a classical computation, if you have bit 0 or 1, you can always copy. You can always generate it. You can always produce a, a cloning. But in the case of a microscopic world, if you don't know what is the state of the system, the state can be anything, right? A zero or one, the linear combination of zero and one. Unless you make a measurement, you don't know what is the state. Unless you know what is the state, you can't copy. So this is known as no cloning theorem, which is really the bottleneck for the hackers. If you have uh, quantum computers, hackers cannot really hack anything because unknown state cannot be copied. So there are other differences, but I always find these three points as a major difference between classical computer and a quantum computer. First one is reversibility. Second one is superordinancy. The third one is no cloning. These are the chief differences. All right. I put it in a very formal way. Having said all the significance of quantum computer, what is the roadmap? How to construct? Know that already we have a desktop, already we have a classical computer. We know how we generated a classical computer. You know pretty well there are two segments, two parts of a classical computer. One is hardware, the other one is software. Hardware, physically we construct certain things in terms of ICs, transistors and gates and all. 
on the other side we write codes which is which can be read by the machine programming languages so hardware and software parallelly developed so that we have a classical computer so similarly we should work on quantum hardware and quantum software algorithm point of view now at the point there are interesting uh, algorithms like grover's algorithm shor's algorithm those are all essen essentially quantum algorithms essentially quantum algorithms which show the prowess of quantum computer but hardware is really a challenge we need to go a long way to realize a quantum computer in front of us right what are the difficulties we are having what is the rule of the game the first and foremost is scalable to increase the number of qubits so issue is though we have electrons as a qubit it's a good candidate electron can be thought of a candidate for realizing qubits but controlling their interaction it's very difficult how to control it that is always a question mark the second one is the initialization that is the most important point you should starting what is the starting point so you have to keep all your qubits in, uh, in a particular state so that is all, always difficult the third issue is known as decoherence for example you keep an electron in a particular state let us say a spin up state what will happen electron is an ele uh, it's a charged particle it always interact with the environment it de decays from its position it decohere from its uh, state so decoherence it's a yet another killer and universal gate set so we say nand nor or universal gate in the classical computation similarly what are the universal gate we don't have an answer for this qubits can be read easily so you should extract the message so though we can store infinite amount of information theoretically in one single qubit how to store the information that is one question mark even if you store how to extract retrieve the information that is another uh, difficulty so we know the road map but we have a lot of challenges in front of us that is the reason why we have a lot of proposals a lot of proposals we have for example nmr nuclear magnetic resonance based quantum computing nmr qc it is known as optical lattice so optical based fiber optics based computing we have and uh, ion trap superconductors so there are very many proposals but every proposal has its own advantage and disadvantage though we know the road map to construct the quantum computer we have a lot of challenges ahead so how to resolve this this is as i pointed out decoherence is a killing aspect of entanglement what is decoherence it's an interaction of the system with the environment because of which the information is lost to the environment so how to protect the qubits from the environment influence that is a challenging one so though we have all this area you can see here quantum computation and quantum information i have listed out so many things as an open problem a lot of scientists throughout the world involved and in india in particular there are very few research groups working on it right so what is the step we have to take so the step is that we have to have a lot of contribution not only from physics students mathematics and computer scientists we require lot and lot of involvement and efforts from engineers because you are the guys who can come up with the final product so quantum computation and information is highly interdisciplinary in nature which involves physics mathematics computer science and engineering too so i take this opportunity to welcome you people to involve and lot of brains required to meet the challenges right so if you ask me the question can we realize quantum computer i take the help of niels bohr who said prediction is always difficult especially if it is about the future so i take the help of niels bohr to answer to this question can we realize quantum computer of course we can do if we have a lot of uh, involvement and enthusiasm and with the help of a lot of people like you guys engineers we can always do All right just to quote the reference uh, quantum computation and information written by nielsen and chong this is a well known uh, book on this topic other books are also available but uh, i uh, always suggest this book 
uh, it's one single book which help you to understand quantum computation and information uh, both from physics point of view as well as computer scientist point of view and uh, i in case if you have uh, any question in detail to be asked you are most welcome to contact me through the following email id and uh, with this uh, point i thank you for your patient listening and uh, once again i thank you all and uh, if you have any question and i would like to answer to the question thank you all any questions yeah yeah yes sir thank you. thank you sir <clears throat> thank you yeah students uh, you can post your queries in the chat box uh, so that uh, professor now? will answer your uh, questions no. now you can yes yeah. <clears throat> not only the students even the faculty <laughs> members can also post yeah, yeah students uh, yeah uh i think balkrishnan sir uh, you can post uh, the query in chat box uh, so that oh, oh, one minute sorry for this <coughs> bank so, uh, i think uh, srinivas sir uh, you can keep away from shukla sir because it is uh, getting a code yeah uh yeah the the, the thing is uh, uh it, it is quite difficult for the first changing students to understand because yeah. of so much of quantum mechanics that is involved in this quantum computation uh, but still out of curiosity uh, don't think that uh, uh, i may go wrong my question may go wrong don't worry about it okay whatever that comes into your mind about it okay you you can post your uh, questions in the uh, chat box i think Pull the chair, sir. Oh, 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 yeah, sorry, Professor Ben. Uh, I think uh, Srinivas, sir. Uh, Srinivas, sir, is here. Uh, sir, please, you put uh, off your uh, phone, sir. Shukla, sir, you can put off your phone and use any one. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Balkhastan, sir, I have one uh, small question. Uh, actually um what exactly is uh, uh, preventing the scientists to make uh, but i heard a news that uh, this google people have come out uh, a, a prototype quantum computer i read it in the newspaper uh, is it the same what we discussed now or any uh, it, it is different from what we are discussing now? uh right sir so uh... you know there are as i pointed out there are difficulties in realizing and uh, google come up with a prototype which is much advanced version uh, oh. but still we need to go a long way because in the practical scalable level it's always a challenging one and mm -hmm. uh, it's a, just a prototype which can perform a very few computational task okay Yeah. Uh, yeah. Find find something. Yes. So then, how they could overcome all these practical difficulties, even if for making that prototype uh, system? So that's true. That's what. So as I said, every physical system has its own advantage and disadvantage. So if you say okay. well, the very first yeah. point to come construct a quantum computer is, you should have at least bunch of electrons. Let us say I I basically I'm a uh, theoretical physicist. I would like to have electron as my Uh, physical realization mm. if i want to construct a quantum computer i need to have at least 10 to 20 electrons okay, okay. how oh. to control those many electrons uh, yeah. precisely that is very yes. very difficult so two elementary are, two, two elementary, elementary. Yeah, to, Ex to control exactly. those particles control yes. yes so precisely let us say okay i have electron 1 2 3 4 and i want mm. to precisely control fifth electron how can i achieve it so that is okay. those are the difficulties yeah okay sir in case uh, let us say we will presume uh, down the line in another two or three decades uh, if some okay innovative minds come out with this uh, type of
uh, there are some network issues at uh, Maruti sir, I believe. Uh, so I request uh, I I request uh, Dr. Uh, Shukla sir uh, to give a vote of thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, sir. And uh, before I go with the vote of thanks, I have a small uh, uh, curiosity question to Dr. Balakrishnan, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, number one, your lecture was really uh, very wonderful for uh, particularly for the beginners and yes. uh, people like me who have very little knowledge in physics, particularly in quantum physics. Yes. And um, I have learned a lot during last uh, 45 minutes or one hour you spoke. I tried to understand, but uh, many things I could not decode. But uh, in the last few moments, I have noticed you told that a qubit, uh, an electron can take the role of qubit or qubit can take the role of electron. So the point is, and you also told there are practical difficulties in realizing this quantum computer because of uh, um, because of the, you can say the nano nature of the technology, rather, uh, rather below nano level, when you go to electronic level, it becomes below nano level even. So the point is, how to realize that electron, how to isolate that electron, if you isolate, and we know that when the electron is isolated, it leaves behind the H plus hole, hole with positive charge equivalent of electron. So what will be the role of that H? in this technology and um, uh, when it comes to practical usage how we, it is difficult to even imagine what kind of computers they will be and how they will be realized can you kindly brief little about it right excellent question sir excellent question right uh, you know uh, let me go back to the macroscopic world uh, we appreciate the work of newton and uh, we also tend to, to think macroscopically because, you know, what we perceive through our eye, we conceptualize and form, formulate the theorem and we work on. But microscopic world, as you rightly pointed out, inaccessible, right? Inaccessible. And our scientists, you know, did a lot of things to understand the microscopic world. Having done that in the past 100 years or so, now we come up to the level of harnessing them for a next future technology. Right. As you rightly said, uh, we have to have a contribution of an electron from an element, only one electron, let us say, which is sitting in the outermost orbit. The other part should be a passive element which should not be affected by our influence. So for example, I have an electron which has spin up or spin down. And when I do something by applying a magnetic field, I want to turn spin up state to spin down state. That I can always do. But by doing so, as you rightly said, the rest of the contribution should be neglected. Neglected in the sense the rest of the portion should not affect. Influence, that is the most important point. That is what precisely the challenge. If you give me one atom, I know how to handle it. I know how much magnetic field I require to keep the electron either spin up or spin down. And I can also isolate the influence of rest of the uh, atom on that particular electron. But when I keep two atoms, this atom will influence on this, this atom will influence on this, right? So not only I'm uh, supposed to avoid the influence of other atom, I also supposed to avoid the influence of the parent atom itself. Assume that if I have 10 electrons, 10 atoms, 20 atoms, it's very difficult to deal with. So that's why precisely we are working on the controlling mechanism. So that, that precisely that is the bottleneck, sir. <coughs> so thank you. Uh, yeah, I yes, hope I have you. answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Balakrishnan. It was thank uh, you, sir. definitely a um, um, sufficient answer uh, to my query. Yes, sir. Uh, now I would like to propose the word of thanks. Uh, first and foremost, um, we must remember and uh, we are thankful and grateful to our uh, chairperson of our institution, Srimati Rama Devi, our chief executive officers, Sri Pramod Gowda and Sri Rajiv Gowda Ji, and our director, Dr. Shankar Pal, sir, uh, in their absentia. We are grateful to them uh, for, um, for consenting and providing this opportunity 
to have a webinar uh, by Dr. Balakrishnan and which has been very, very uh, informative and educative for all of us, not only for students, but for the faculty members also. I am very grateful to our principal, sir, Dr. Satish, um, and vice principal, Dr. Yogesh, sir, for their uh, constant encouragement and uh, uh, allowing us to make the arrangement for this webinar uh, through YouTube and StreamYard. And um, we were able to make it uh, materialize. So I'm very grateful to both of them. I'm also thankful to our head of the Department of Basic Sciences, Dr. Maruti, sir, who is who has been behind this program since a long time and he was in touch with you and he took all the pains to organize and, um, and did it systematically. We are grateful to you, sir. It was a good insight for our students to learn the basics of um, uh, classical and quantum physics and um, quantum mechanics, rather quantum computation. So it's a wonderful opportunity and it is a, a frontier uh, field of research and in physics and computers. And uh, still many things are unknown. So it is a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, to start learning about it from the um, eminent scientists like Dr. Balakrishna. So we are very thankful to you. And uh, my heartfelt thanks go to um, all the basic sciences and all the engineering departments, faculties who have been helping us in organizing this program in various ways. Um, I, I cannot take all the names here. So in, in common, I am telling to each and everyone, our heartfelt thanks go to them. And um, um, we are very grateful to all of them, including our students. Most important, the most important audience for this program is our students, uh, not only from the first year, but also from the higher semesters. And I'm sure those who are in computer science, information science or any engineering branch, it is a basic science subject, which is concerning all the branches of engineering uh, or even science because science is a in, is a basic um, uh, basic idea behind every engineering or technology so it is uh, it is concerned as well as it may, must be interesting to everyone to understand the fundamentals so with that i, I thank our students also they have uh, been keen also to listen to you sir and we all had benefited with this knowledge and possibly in future uh, whenever we are going to read about quantum computation we, we are reading time to time so we, we we can keep remembering you that yes you had given a basic insight into this subject so we are very grateful to you sir on behalf of all east point group of institutions faculties students uh, and on my personal behalf i wish to um, I, I wish to express my gratitude and thanks to you, sir, for sparing your um, time for us and uh, spend this time usefully and uh, benefiting us about this knowledge. So thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of everyone from EPGI, my grateful thanks to you, sir. Thank With that, you. I would thank like you. to conclude. God bless you. Have thank a good health. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shikla, sir. In in fact, uh, in the Balakrishna Sir's College, that is in VIT, next week, they are going to have a NAC inspection. And they are okay. extremely busy in, in preparing for that inspection. But in spite of that, in truly, 